Imagine waking up tomorrow to a world where your smartphone won't charge. Wind turbines stand motionless, and electric vehicles roll off production lines incomplete. Not because of war, not because of natural disaster, but because 17 obscure elements, most people can't even pronounce their names, have vanished from global supply chains. This isn't science fiction. It's a geopolitical reality that took 40 years to construct and could reshape global power in a matter of months. Today, we're dissecting one of the most successful industrial conquests in modern history. How China executed a four-decade strategy to dominate the world's most critical resource. And why the West is now scrambling to catch up in what experts call the new Cold War over critical materials. This is the story of 17 elements that most people have never heard of, but which power everything from the device you're watching this on, to the defense systems protecting your nation. Our story begins not with mining equipment or geological surveys, but with a prophecy. The year is 1992. Deng Xiaoping, one of the architects of modern China, is making his pivotal southern tours, a journey designed to silence conservative hardliners and cement China's path toward economic reform. But during a stop in Baotou, Inner Mongolia, at a rare earth facility, he uttered the words that would define the next four decades of global industrial warfare. The Middle East has oil. China has rare earths. This wasn't boastful rhetoric. It was a strategic directive from the top of the Chinese Communist Party, a declaration that China would view these 17 elements not as simple commodities to be sold, but as a source of future global power, a strategic lever to be explored, exploited, and ultimately weaponized. Before we understand China's strategy, we need to understand what rare earths actually are. Despite their name, they're not particularly rare. Cerium is more abundant than copper. The rare designation comes from their geological distribution and the extracting them in commercially viable concentrations. These 17 elements 15 lanthanides plus yttrium and scandium possess unique, magnetic, catalytic, and optical properties that make them irreplaceable in modern technology. They're divided into two categories. Light rare earths, lares like neodymium and praseodymium, essential for the permanent magnets in electric vehicle motors and wind turbines. Heavy rare earths hers like dysprosium and terbium, critical for high-performance magnets that function under extreme conditions, the kind found in military, defense systems and advanced aerospace applications. In 1992, Deng's prophecy seemed absurd. The United States was the world's dominant rare earth producer, controlling over 80% of global supply through California's Mountain Pass mine. China was producing just 27% of the world's rare earths and had virtually no processing capabilities. But Deng wasn't talking about maintaining a lead. He was outlining a complete hostile takeover. It's a multi-decade asymmetric strategy where, while the West focused on the technologies of today, China would quietly seize control of the foundational elements of tomorrow's technology. China's rare earth strategy was built on a foundation of extraordinary geological composition. The nation possessed not one, but two distinct types of globally significant rare earth deposits, giving it unique advantages across the entire spectrum of these critical materials. In Inner Mongolia lies the Bayon Obo Mind, the world's largest rare earth deposit. It's originally discovered in 1927 as an iron ore deposit. Its rare earth potential wasn't fully realized until decades later. This geological anomaly contains an estimated 70% of the world's known rare earth reserves at its peak. Bayon Obo is primarily rich in light rare earths, especially neodymium and praseodymium, the essential ingredients for permanent magnets that power electric vehicles, wind turbines, and consumer electronics. Because rare earths are extracted as a byproduct of iron mining, the operation maintains significant cost advantages over dedicated rare earth mines. But China's true ace lies in the south, Cross provinces like Jiangxi and Guangdong are the world's only major deposits of ion adsorption, clasinique, geological formations that are the planet's primary source of heavy rare earths. These deposits formed over millions of years as weathering broke down granite, leaving rare earth elements loosely bonded to clay particles. They can be extracted using simple chemical solutions like ammonium sulfate, a low-tech, cheap process that gives China a virtual monopoly on the most valuable and strategically critical rare earths. Heavy rare earths like dysprosium and terbium are essential for high-performance magnets that operate under extreme temperatures 
the kind found in missile guidance systems, satellite components, and advanced military hardware. This dual deposit advantage was a geopolitical jackpot. Buy and oboe provided volume for mass market applications. While the Southern Clays gave China a chokehold on the high value, high tech elements the rest of the world would desperately need. China controlled the entire value chain from commodity to cutting edge applications. Armed with Deng's vision and this geological advantage, China was ready to begin its conquest. China's strategy was simple, weaponized price. Starting in the 1980s, Beijing aggressively supported its nascent rare earth industry through a combination of export tax rebates of up to 17%, direct state subsidies, massive research and development funding through programs like the National High Tech Research and Development Program. But the real weapon was a near total disregard for environmental costs. Despite the West always being absolutely cynical about its own operations, Chinese operations were allowed to run with minimal oversight. The immense costs of treating radioactive wastewater, preventing soil contamination, and protecting workers were partly externalized, pushed eventually onto the land and the people. This created a hidden subsidy that no Western company could match. Chinese producers could flood global markets with rare earths at prices below the actual cost of production for international competitors. The results were devastating for Western producers. In 1990, China produced 27% of the world's rare earths. By 2008, its share had skyrocketed to over 97%. The world's rare earth production had been almost entirely consolidated into one country. The first defeated by the economic vision was Mountain Pass nestled in California's Mojave Desert. For decades, this mine had been the global epicenter of rare earth production, supplying essential materials for everything from color televisions to military lasers. But Mountain Pass couldn't withstand the Chinese boldness. Its owner Unical was caught in an impossible vice, plunging global prices on one side, mounting environmental compliance costs on the other, including dealing with radioactive wastewater leaks from aging pipelines. In 2002, the inevitable happened. Mountain Pass suspended all mining operations. With that single decision, the United States, once the world's rare earth leader, showed its incompetence and officially exited the business, ceding the entire global market to China. In 2008, Chevron sold the mine to privately held Mali Corp Minerals LLC, company formed to revive the Mountain Pass mine. The processing plant was in full production on June 25, 2015. When Molocorp filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy with outstanding bonds in the amount of US$1.4 billion, United States dollars, the company's shares were removed from the NYSE. Mountain Pass was acquired out of bankruptcy in July 2017 with the goal of reviving America's rare earth industry. MP Materials resumed mining and refining operations in January 2018. According to Bloomberg, China in 2019 established a plan for restricting U.S. access to Chinese heavy rare earth elements should the punitive step be deemed necessary. In 2022, the company announced that it had secured Department of Defense grants to support both light rare earth elements RHRAs and heavy rare earth elements HREEs. The facility plans to begin separating NDPR oxide in early 2023. The West saw efficient outsourcing got cheap critical materials without the dirty, difficult work of extraction. But it wasn't just outsourcing a commodity, it was outsourcing a critical national capability, and ending a strategic rival the keys to 21st century technological infrastructure. By the mid-2000s, China's strategy almost backfired. The introduction of export quotas to maintain high prices sparked a massive black market that threatened Beijing's carefully constructed plans. Thousands of illegal mines sprang up, especially in the resource-rich South. These operations flouted environmental rules, dodged taxes, and ignored production quotas. At its peak, an estimated third of all Chinese rare earth exports were smuggled out, illegally tens of thousands of tons per year. This rampant smuggling undercut state pricing power and made export quotas meaningless. The Wild West had come to the rare earth empire. Beijing's response was swift and absolute. Starting in the late 2000s, the government launched a massive consolidation campaign. Hundreds of illegal mines were shut down, 
and the entire fragmented industry was forcibly absorbed into a handful of massive, vertically integrated state-owned enterprises. This campaign reached its zenith in December 2021, with the creation of the China Rare Earth Group, a colossal entity designed to act as the state's command and control center for global rare earth markets. The consolidation wasn't just about economic efficiency, it was about weaponization. A fragmented market of thousands of rogue miners can't be used as a geopolitical tool. But a bold plan developed by a planned economy can compete in global markets with surgical precision, turning supply on and off like a faucet. September 7, 2010 A minor maritime incident near the disputed Senkaku Islands becomes the flashpoint that changes everything. After Japan arrested a Chinese fishing captain following a collision with Coast Guard vessels, Beijing's retaliation was swift and shocking. China, unofficially, but completely halted all rare earth shipments to Japan, the world's most advanced electronics manufacturer. For the first time, China had overtly used its rare earth monopoly as a geopolitical weapon. The embargo sent shockwaves through global high-tech industries, from Tokyo to Silicon Valley to Berlin. Companies that built the modern world suddenly realized their entire production lines depended on a single, potentially hostile source. Prices for critical rare earths exploded in some cases by over 1,000%. The abstract threat of dependency had become terrifyingly real. The 2010 embargo was the West's Sputnik moment a shocking demonstration of profound strategic vulnerability. The world had finally awakened to the power of China's empire of elements, and the race to build alternatives began. But by the 2020s, China's strategy had evolved beyond controlling raw materials. The new goal was to monopolize intellectual property, the crucial know-how required to transform or into useful products. In December 2023, Beijing added rare earth extraction and separation technologies to its export ban list followed by restrictions on magnet manufacturing technology. This was a strategic masterstroke. The West could theoretically find and mine its own rare earth ores. But without decades of accumulated Chinese expertise in separation and processing, that ore remains nearly worthless. China had shifted from a resource monopoly to a far more defensible knowledge monopoly. As we approach the end of 2025, China accounts for 69.2% of the world's total rare earth mine production, with a production quota of 270,000 metric tons. This doesn't include undocumented production, meaning the real figure could be higher. More critically, MP Materials is expected to produce only 1,000 metric tons of neodymium iron boron. Magnets by 2025 representing less than 1% of the 138,000 metric tons China produced as early as 2018. The response is a frantic high-stakes multi-billion dollar race by Western nations to build a complete non-Chinese supply chain from scratch. Now, key players include United States MP Materials has resurrected Mountain Pass with hundreds of millions in Defense Department backing. In January 2025, their independence facility in Fort Worth, Texas commenced operations. In 2024, they announced record production of 1,300 tons of neodymium praseodymium oxide. Australia. Linas became the first producer of heavy rare earths outside China in 2025. Commissioning a new separation circuit at their Malaysia plant with first dysprosium production in May and terbium in June, they're also constructing a separation facility in Texas with U.S. government support. Government support. Japan is aggressively funding overseas projects. Having learned from 2010, the EU enacted its Critical Raw Materials Act setting ambitious targets to onshore mining and processing. This is an incredibly expensive, technically challenging, decades-long race against time. The Western Alliance is trying to replicate in 10 years what China built over 40 years. With full state support and brutal disregard for costs, building a new mine 2 magnet supply chain is colossally expensive. A single mine can take 18 years and billions of dollars from discovery to production. To the 2015 bankruptcy of Molly Corp's first Mountain Pass revival attempt, despite raising over a billion dollars, looms large over current efforts. Perhaps most critically, decades of outsourcing have left the West with a severe shortage of engineers and metallurgists who understand the complex chemistry of rare earth separation. This knowledge gap may prove as challenging as the geological one. 
China built its empire of elements through four key strategies. Visionary foresight, identifying a future dependency the world had overlooked. Economic warfare, a ruthless price war, driven by a unique strategic sense that only a planned economy can provide. Strategic consolidation, transforming chaotic domestic industry into a centralized tool of state power. Knowledge monopoly, securing not just resources, but the expertise to use them. This represents one of the most successful industrial conquests in modern history. A 40-year strategy that transformed China from a minor player to the dominant force in materials critical to the 21st century, yet wielding the rare earth weapon carries risks. The 2010 Japan embargo, while demonstrating power, was the greatest catalyst for global diversification efforts. A sustained export ban could destroy China's reputation as a reliable supplier and accelerate Western alternatives. Recent restrictions are already costing European companies millions of euros, but they're also strengthening resolve for supply chain independence. We're witnessing a new great game the battle for the elements of the 21st century. The next decade will be decisive. Will the Western alliance succeed in its costly race to build parallel supply chains, breaking the monopoly and securing technological sovereignty? Or will China's fortecade head start prove insurmountable? This isn't just about mining and manufacturing, it's about the future of global power. Whichever side controls these critical materials will have significant leverage over the technologies that define modern civilization. Clean energy, advanced computing, military systems, and space exploration. China played the long game for four decades to build its empire. The West has just started playing. The question isn't whether they can catch up, it's whether they can do it fast enough. As you watch this video on a device powered by rare earth magnets, remember, every smartphone, every electric vehicle, every wind turbine represents a small victory in a battle most people don't even know is being fought. The empire of elements is real, it's consequential, and its outcome will shape the balance of power for generations to come. The rare earth wars have begun. The world is only just waking up to what's at stake. And don't forget, like the video, and subscribe the channel to keep thinking the world how it really is.